Thank you, Tomo. It's an honor to be here. And I, I have to say that in my life, Japan has been incredibly important. And I look back and I think about when I was very, very young and Toshio Nakamura from ANU Magazine published my work. I think I had built almost nothing. And, and I was invited in 1988 by Arata Izasaki to build the Fukuoka housing, which is still there, void space, hinge space housing in Fukuoka. And Yosho and Yukio Furugawa built, uh, published my work in 1993, Global Architecture Number 11. So, and then Tomo and I built the Makuhari Project, opened in 1996. And in fact, the work that I've done in China, it comes a little bit from uh, the clients being able to visit Japan. So it's really great to be back here and, and to make this talk. Let's see if I can get the first slide. This, this talk is about a book I've been working on for a year and a half. It's called Compression. And it brings together five volumes. My first, my first book of theory was called Anchoring. And I really believe today more than ever, we need to think about theory. Uh, everyone's busy building a very large glass skyscrapers and no one's thinking. And I think when I, when I wrote this book 30 years ago, it was about the, the nature of the site and the circumstance and, and an idea that drives the design. These principles I'm still working with on all our projects. But as we move, as I move forward in this volume, I want to bring to bear ideas that I think are even exciting today. And the, the original title was Archite Architecture Activating the Brain. And it was about the notion of neuroscience being able to be something special today that it, it never has been in terms of uh, the, the scientific advances. So I would just start and hit on these points, but you'll have to get the book because it's much more involved. And I, I was lecturing at the Salk Institute and I was lecturing in front of a lot of scientists and I, I, I was speaking about my feeling that architecture changes your life. And it's, it's something was very exciting. I was with the, the neuroscientist Eric Kandel, who had just written a book about art and the brain. And he, he was speaking about how we need abstraction. And I was thinking, this is something I felt very strongly about, that he, he talked about it being thinking from the bottom up instead of the top down. If you're given something, some literal thing, it's very difficult to form your own intuitive ideas. Another uh, condition then I developed after that talk was the notion of the environment, the body, and the brain. They're all in a relationship. We all know that our, our, our today our physical health actually has an impact on how clearly we can think. We know that the environment is intertwined with that. We know that we, we have all these neuroscience uh, developments, but the one thing we don't have is that relationship of the mind, that dotted, that dotted line of the mind. And I call that stochastic thinking or analogical thinking. So for me, it's this is how I teach also at Columbia University, that the way the mind works is to really understand this kind of intuition that must never be uh, pushed out by, by, by rationalism. So what was interesting when I, when I spoke at the Salk Institute is that the scientists agreed. They understood what I was talking about when I said stochastic thinking. And I use this image here uh, because I just gave this lecture in Louisville, Kentucky, and the oldest protege of Le Corbusier is Jose Ubery, and he was in the audience, 87 years old. There he is right there. There's Corbusier. And, and, and you know, we discussed this, and he felt in a way that, for example, when, Jose, when uh, Le Corbusier did Ronchamp, 
and use a crab shell as the inspiration for this strange roof. This is a kind of analogical thinking. So natural light is key to all of our projects. And I, I will quote Lebius Woods, my great friend, the late Lebius Woods. Light is the main thing. Light is a natural phenomena, the complexities of which reveal the structure of human consciousness. Objects, including buildings with their absorption and reflection of light, stimulate a human brain's neural networks, in effect activating the brain. The more complex and nuanced the simulation, the more fully the brain comes to life. So natural light to me is key in every project, and I, I actually began my studies uh, as a student living behind the Pantheon in Rome. So there, there, that was like a, a vessel of natural light, 2,000 years old. Water, the body is three quarters water. The earth is three quarters water. To me, the relation of water is central to architecture and to landscape and to our consciousness. This is where I grew up. In fact, that's the first house I ever did there. Strange little wooden house in Manchester, Washington. But it, I grew up on Puget Sound, this great body of water. In fact, it's a little bit, in a way, uh, Japanese. The Mount Rainier was at the end of this bay, like Mount Fuji is uh, uh, overlooking with its white snow peaks. But this notion of water then, to me, is something I like to bring back in landscape. In fact, almost all my projects contain some natural water element. Psychological space. When I was a student at the University of Washington, the professors were very rationalistic. They said they assigned a cube, eight by eight by eight, and they said, make this about your living, your working, your, your architectural drawing boards, do everything and give us a design. And I made, a, I made this weird shape. I, I said, you're leaving out the most important part, psychological space. And I almost flunked architecture school because of it. Negative capability. That's a chapter about our current government. And uh, in order not to be negative, you'll have to buy the book in order to read that, that chapter. I'm going to not go into it in detail, but you can imagine uh, what's happening in America, which is not very pleasant. The architectonics of music. music is an immersive experience, as is architecture. You know, you can look at sculpture and you can turn away from it. You, you can look at painting and you can turn away from it. But music surrounds you and architecture surrounds you. So we often use music as an analogy. And this house was made from a piece by Bela Bartok that was in four movements, four, four heavy movements and four light movements. Social condensers. I believe that architecture, architecture really can be a kind of social condenser. And, and I, I really aim to making buildings become something that reach out to the community and bring people together. And this little project in, in Queens, the, the community library of Hunter's Point, is a good example of that kind of belief. It's at the base of a lot of skyscrapers just recently built, condominium towers, just like every city. The original developers there were going to give the library three floors in the bottom of the skyscraper for the community library. And one of the congressmen said, no, we want a building that stands by itself and expresses library. This was a great moment. You know, this is what we need, I think, in every city, as developers seem to be overtaking most urban centers. We need to be able to read where are the public buildings. What do they, they, they have an expression that's different from just a developer skyscraper. And when we started, we realized that the site was so large that the building could be just on one floor. And I had some very ugly drawings. I, I'm, you know, there's a lot of students here. <laughs> Jose Uberi said, Stephen, please show all of your rejected watercolors so students can understand the, pro the process is a long one of discovery. 
And you can see some very, uh, let's say, crude and ugly first sketches. By the way, a lot of these are in the exhibition over at the Arca Depot. And finally, there was a drawing that spoke about seeing the, the city across from, from the site, looking back at Manhattan, at the same time moving through the books, the, the notion of, of, of the balance of the book and the digital. When we were given this commission in, nine years ago, some people said the library doesn't need books, where everybody's on the computer. And I said, no, no, let's balance that. So behind every book tier is a computer desk. So all, this, all the people are on their computer desks, they're on their computers, but the books, when you come in, you see the, the, the rows of books going up. So this is a balance between the digital and the book. And you can see, once we had that idea, after, after somehow 30 schemes were rejected, then I could do this section through the building with, this, with the children's section, and the teen section, the adult section, the auditorium. We worked out the drawings in, in 48 hours. Once the, once the clarity of the concept was there, and that's how the building is built, in fact. That's, that's the built section with the relation of these different, these different parts. The building <clears throat> has no columns. The, the exterior is the structure, a concrete shear wall structure that's uh, stained silver. There you see a model of the building. It sat in my, my office in New York for three years, I think, struggling to get permission to build it, struggling to get the authorities to, to let it pass. And, and then finally, it went into construction. And then we had to fight with the contractors. I wanted, to, I wanted the whole building, because this, the structure's on the outside, I wanted to give a special texture. And I was trying to get the contractor to do it in bubble wrap so that there would really be a, an amazing texture in the concrete. We lost that battle, but there I was uh, in 2015, struggling at every detail, which we do in all of our work, visiting the site under construction, and, 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 and here are just a couple of shots with children's using the children's, the children's library. I think you can go online on Vimeo and see many other views of the building. But the structure is the form. I think, uh, you know, this is something you'll see in most every project here, that structure and, and, and space and light are united. So we'd like to ask uh, Mr. Stephen Hall and Professor Tanaka to join us on the stage again. Thank you for the lecture. So we'd like to start the question and answer session. So as we, you know, uh, they explained, uh, we picked, uh, they took uh, uh, questions uh, from the website, and I, we picked a couple of questions to ask you. Uh, first, first question is, uh, what, what did you think good uh, among the things you did when you were a student? Or is there anything you regret for not doing those days? In my student days? Yeah, your student days. I, I think the most important thing that happened to me was to leave Seattle, to leave the University of Washington when I was, when I was in my third year and go to Rome and live behind the Pantheon. That was a great, that was a great uh, shock. Uh, I think one really needs to travel and look at other buildings and look at other architecture. It's probably the most important thing that happened to me because once I came back to Seattle, I, I saw everything with different eyes. And uh, I mean, it was, uh, I'd never been to Europe before. So, uh, and then living behind the Pantheon, it was uh, amazing. I mean, uh, I, I think that's, that's uh, <laughs> you know, when I started as a, as a teenager in Bremerton, Washington, I was a hot rodder. I, I had a, a, I was, you know, building cars. 
I never, you know, I, I wasn't sure I was going to be an architect. I wasn't, you know, I loved architecture. I thought I did. And I went to the University of Washington and I stopped all the hot rodding with the cars and all of that. And, and I began to study, but I wasn't convinced by the professors at all. I found the professors very boring, you know. <laughs> And I actually didn't agree with them, you know. That's why that psychological space with that drawing, they, they, were, they, they, they didn't think I was, they thought I was too arrogant. But going to Rome changed everything, you know, to see these great buildings. So, so in a way, the, the city of Rome itself is a kind of living textbooks for you or the, right. the great teacher of architecture by right. itself, the city. But, but two things. Well, the second thing was I went to the AA. Instead of going to graduate school in America, I went to the Architecture Association in London at the same time that Zaha Hadid was a student. I, we were you know, students together. And, uh, and uh, Elia Zangales, Charles Jenks, Rem Koolhaas, James Sterling was there. So I had this chance in 1976 of enormous uh, immersion in contemporary architecture. So that was also something great. Okay. Uh, thank you. So let's move to the second question. Uh, you know, this question says, you know, in your design, uh, the space in between the mass and the voice looks very fascinating. You know, one example is the, the one in the Shimon's Hall in MIT. It says, uh, this sense of space is something very similar to the one found in Japanese architecture. Right. And then, what do you think of such a spatial compositions? Or do you change, and also in the des your design process, do you change the kind of focal points when you progress in your design process? These are two questions inside. Yeah. Uh, I think the void space for me is, is primary. You know, the, 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 the thing contained is not the thing containing. In other words, you know, like I think maybe one breakthrough, early project, my first very large project is the Fukuoka void space, hinge space housing. And I conceived the project of four voids with water and four voids on the north so the sun would shine through the building diagonally. And I was very excited they built it as I drew it, and it's still there. It's, I, I'm very proud of that project in Fukuoka. And it's all inhabited by architects and interior designers now. When I came here in 2014 for the Premium Imperiale, which is another thing I forgot to be so thankful for, which is the greatest prize that I could get in my life, and I was here and I gave a lecture, and then after the talk, two people came up to me who lived in Fukuoka, in my housing project in Fukuoka, and one said he became an architect because of that building. Yeah. He was grown up there. Yeah. I, 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 he I, was a little I met, he grew up him. there. Yeah, he was, that's kind of playground when he right. was young, but the kind of probably that's gave a great lots of experience. Compliment. You know. To me, it's a great compliment. But void, yeah, void is very, very important. I still work, I always think about the, the space that's being formed, you know. Not so much the object itself, but the space that's being formed. And I always say, my, my, my early, one professor, Professor Herman Pont said, that I never forget, and this is going back to the University of Washington, he said, Stephen, a building must be more when you go in it than when you look at it. And I always think that when I'm making a design, that it must be more when you go in it than when you look at it. And I think all my projects, hopefully, he's, passed away now, but he's turning in his grave every time I say that. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I think, you know, uh, we have plenty of time in spend, so we'd like to close uh, this session, Q&A session. So thank you very much, Stephen, to give a great lecture and for the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stephen Hall, and thank you, Professor Tanaka.